day. Um, we are happy to have all of you here. Thank you for joining us for the session on how to reduce the carbon footprint of concrete. As you all get settled in, a few housekeeping reminders. Please do not use the chat box to ask any questions for today's panelists. Instead, use the Q&A portion. With the Q&A feature, attendees can like a question to move it to the top of the list. And as always, content and additional resources will be available on the AA California website shortly after the session. Today's session focused on sustainable concrete designs is brought to you by National Ready Mix Concrete Association. The session qualifies for one AIA HSW learning unit for those who watch live. AIA California staff will report those units for you once you have finished the session. To introduce our presenters today, Brandon Ray is a civil engineer with 10 years of experience in the concrete materials and construction industry. His role as director of the building Innov innovations for the National Ready Mix Concrete Association, he promotes concrete and concrete technologies throughout the design community with a special focus on sustainability. Margot Burkholder is a licensed structural engineer with 12 years of design experience in the Los Angeles area. She has worked on a range of projects and project types and ex has experience in high rise and performance based design, seismic retrofit, rehabilitation, multifamily residential, commercial, mixed use, retail, sports, and entertainment. Thank you both for being here today. Brandon, I will hand it over to you. Perfect, thank you, Rebecca. Um, assuming everyone can see this, we'll kind of get started here. Um, to kick things off, I'd just like to say thank you for, for joining us to talk about the top 10 ways to reduce concrete's carbon footprint. This is obviously a topic of, of high interest these days as we're all trying to work towards our sustainability goals. Uh, to jump into things here, let's see. Um, to really set the stage as to why this is important for all of us in the design build community is we really need to focus on reducing our embodied carbon footprint of the built environment. Uh, the UN Environmental Global Status Report um, in 2017 released uh, projected figures of about 2.5 trillion square feet of new construction needed by 2060. So this is currently double the existing building stock. And uh, their encouragement is to um, focus on designing disaster resilient buildings. The best sustainable options are to, to, you know, to build once and not twice. And to also design zero energy buildings, um, as well as reducing the embodied impacts of the materials that go into them. For this purpose, you know, concrete is one of the most widely used materials on earth. Um, because of its thermal mass, concrete has long been a material of choice for energy efficiency. And because of its strength and durability, it has been a material of choice for disaster resilience as well. The challenge ultimately is to offer these concrete benefits with lower carbon footprint. And this presentation is ultimately how we can touch on at least top 10 ways how we can achieve that with technologies and things that are available today. So these recommendations ultimately are not listed in our, well, they are listed in broadly in order of priority, but not in order of impact reduction. These mechanisms and levers we're discussing today cross multiple disciplines to varying degrees. So I know it might not be pertinent to everyone, but when it comes to their implementation, we have a leadership responsibility to our communities and our clients to increase awareness and elevate usage of these good sustainable practices whenever we can. Um, from the list here, we can just run through it real quick that uh, number one, communicate carbon reduction goals. Uh, number two, ensure good quality control and assurance. Uh, three, optimize concrete design. Four, specify innovative cements. Five, specify supplemental cementitious materials. Six, specify admixtures. Seven, don't limit ingredients. And eight, set targets for carbon footprint. Nine, sequester carbon dioxide and concrete. And 10, encourage innovation. So number one on our list, communicate carbon reduction goals. This is the most important step. One of the basic tenets of achieving a goal is to effectively uh, communicate that goal to everyone on the project team. Concrete is not a commodity. Um, despite often being described as such, it is more than just PSI. So concrete itself, this makes it, um, you know, communication of the material is most important. So the communication ultimately plays into um, the importance of quantifying and, the, and establishing the different parameters and mix criteria. To make sure that reducing embodied carbon remains a priority on the project, 
uh, it must be included in drawings and specifications that communicate this to the owner, contractor, and product suppliers. For this, we have three basic recommendations. The first is to collaborate. The only way you can really set your carbon footprint goal is to understand the capabilities of contractors and producers who are gonna work on the project. So invite them in for meetings with your design team, understand what technologies and concrete ingredients are available locally. And just because a product isn't generally used in a market doesn't mean you should prohibit or avoid its use. Early collaboration really is key to opening up the door on material availability and implementation of these technologies. Next is to specify goals in your targets, uh, uh, your goals or targets. Uh, state in your, um, set the goal in the beginning of the project in your concrete specification. So in your 3300 part one, just make it clear what level of carbon reduction you are trying to accomplish, um, specifically for carbon itself, but we also recommend this for all materials on, on the project, not just concrete. And then communicate again in pre bid meetings. So it is also important to really communicate these carbon reduction goals in other ways. And most projects have these pre bid meetings where you have opportunities to communicate carbon reduction goals for all products and all potential bidders. Uh, you may be surprised really to find that project collaborators may already have a lot of procedures in place to help achieve uh, the sustainable goals on the project. Strategy number two is to ensure good quality control. Concrete producers design concrete mixtures to meet the needs of the contractor in terms of workability, which comprises flowability, pumpability, finishability, things of that nature. And they do this based on the local aggregates and, and, and local materials that are available and using sufficient quantity of cementitious materials to achieve the required compressive strength, which is higher than the specified compressive strength. So this over-design is based on well-established statistical methods that are described in codes and standards. The efficacy of quality control practices though can impact this over-design. So lower over-design means lower cementitious materials content. So for a quick example, going from 1200 PSI to 600 PSI over design would likely require 60 pounds less of cementitious material, which is potentially around an 8% decrease in embodied carbon just by incorporating good quality control practices. One way to provide some assurance that concrete producer and has good quality control is to require certifications of their manufacturing facilities, mixture trucks, concrete technicians, and plant operators. You should always specify that plants, trucks, and personnel operating them are certified and common certifications include NRMCA's Certified Concrete Production Facility, which governs plant operations, and NRMCA Concrete Technologist Certification, which governs mix design proportioning. The same can be said of installers and independent testing laboratories and their personnel. In the quality assurance section of the concrete specification, require that installers are ACI certified, while concrete producers have their plants and technicians certified as well. These same principles do apply to testing labs, so make sure they are qualified and their personnel are certified as well. The goal of testing is to mirror in situ conditions to validate in situ performance. Minor variations in sample sets can have reverberating effects on the qualifying, uh, on qualifying performance. We've all seen low breaks cast doubt on performance only to find cord samples proving performance in excess of design requirements. So there are well-established procedures for taking samples of concrete and preparing test specimens, storing them on site, transporting to a laboratory, and ultimately testing them to their appropriate ASTM standards. Concrete itself rarely tests well when testing protocols are not followed. Um, you know, you have uh, cylinders freeze outside or not cured appropriately, you're going to get differentiation or variations in your results. If these test results are constantly showing lower strength, then the only way to overcome them is to increase the overdesign which generally raises cementitious content and ultimately impacts the global warming potential of your mixes and the sustainability of your project. Number three, we have optimized concrete design. So this strategy is just about employing good design practices. If a structural element such as a column or beam is designed larger than required, the excess of concrete is gonna be used, which can increase embodied carbon. Alternatively, for a high-rise building, reducing the size of columns might be critical to keeping the rentable space to a maximum, but that generally means using higher strength concrete, which can impact uh, the carbon footprint of the project. But there may be a balance in terms of uh, increasing the impact of certain elements such that the reduced uh, frequency can also beneficiate the project. For this, we ultimately suggest using life cycle analysis software to quickly calculate the embodied carbon of concrete elements. So use this to iteratively review design of architectural and structural elements. The overall target is a balanced design regarding such things as span lengths and column grids, with the end product being increased efficiency and efficacy of the material usage. 
Additionally, with higher quality materials, you can lower water demand and yield tighter standard deviations. So going back to kind of the quality control option I mentioned, uh, a 1200 PSI design, uh, over design can result in a uh, eight to 10% increase in GWP over a 600 PSI over design. So higher quality ingredients can help play into better standard deviations and reduce the need for such a uh, high over design. Higher modulus of elasticity materials, so better quality materials can allow for innovative design strategies such as increased deck spans with less deflection or narrow columns with, uh, that to withstand the same seismic drift or wind loads. Last on this list right here is uh, leveraging later design strengths, um, looking at more efficient use of SCMs as a PSI per pound of cementitious material will increase dramatically. So avoid emphasizing short strength periods when ultimate strength is truly not needed for much longer periods of time. Consider establishing a 28 day strength in combination with a 56 day or 90 day strength where applicable. Additionally, leverage the use of maturity testing to take advantage of the strength increase of in situ concrete for such things as PT decks that need early age strengths. It is commonly observed that in situ concrete outperforms small samples and maturity testing is a way to improve design efficiency. As an example here, we see the impacts of incorporating a higher quality aggregate, of aggregate material yielding improved material efficiencies. Note that this is only comparing cement content, not GWP, uh, and looks at just a standard 15% flash mix in order to isolate the effects of the aggregate. But when combined with additional levers, reductions can be compounded. So in this example, for equivalent performance, we see cement reductions that can realize an approximate 20% reduction in GWP just from swapping out aggregates. Lastly, consider exposing concrete wherever possible. Finished materials do have a considerable carbon footprint, and since exposed concrete can be attractive and is fire resistant without the, the need for additional protection, this is an excellent strategy for reducing the carbon footprint of a building. The other benefit of leaving concrete exposed is that concrete does absorb carbon over time through a process called carbonation, which we'll touch on shortly. Number four on our list, specify innovative cements. So cement manufacturing, is, primary, is the primary contributor to global warming potential of, of a concrete mix. So despite being around six to 12% of concrete's volume, cement accounts for upwards of 90% of the GWP emission. So offsetting the use of traditional cement is gonna be a plug and play solution to reduce emissions. Now, how is this accomplished? Simply through the use of ASTM C595 for blended cements. This is compared to your traditional ASTM C150 cement, which is probably most traditionally in your, your specification. Without going into too much detail, during cement manufacturing, limestone is fired in a kiln at high temperatures, and the fuel burned during this process is a contributor to global emissions, while the chemical breakdown of limestone also releases CO2. So with blended cements, we're able to reduce the amount of material that is fired in the kiln, and thus directly and simply reducing the carbon emissions. There are several blended cements that combine ordinary Portland cement with other materials, most common blended cement is gonna be Portland limestone cement, so often called PLC or type 1L. This cement is, uh, combines up to 15% of limestone, uh, which is interground with the Portland cement to make a product with a carbon footprint that is about 10% lower than ordinary Portland cement and performance that is identical to, and in many cases outperforms ordinary Portland cement. So in California, Caltrans just recently approved PLC for use across the state after undergoing a rigorous testing program that involved validating PLC as an engineered product with a one-to-one -one replacement of traditional cement. There are other blended cements available under ASTM C595 as well that involve blending such things as slag or pozzolanic materials. Although not as commonly used in present day production, including these materials will future-proof your specifications as they are actively being developed. So I frequently hear the question, you know, what happens when fly ash runs out as coal power plants shut down. Well, surprisingly enough, there are decades worth of landfill fly ash from times before when we incorporated it into concrete that are readily available to be processed and incorporated into blended cements. So these types of products would be a type one P cement and production of these materials are already underway. There are plants being set up on these, um, these deposits and essentially working towards processing and incorporating them into the actual end product. In the Western US, we're also very fortunate to have many natural volcanic material deposits that can be incorporated in much the same way. And that would fall under also the 1P designation. 
And just as a quick note, there is also another ASTM specification that's not listed on the screen just yet, but um, ASTM C1157, which is for performance-based blended cements, which doesn't have a direct limit on the composition, but allows considerable more flexibility. So here's a quick visual. We see the comparison between uh, Portland Cement Association's national average DWP for uh, cement. So that's on the left there, compared against California cements, which are type 25 and are type three. Uh, which is a high early. And then further comparing PLC, your type 1L, which shows a 10% further reduction over the current standard California cement. The solution ultimately for this one is easy. Just list all three products uh, of or types of hydraulic cement in your specification. So your ASTM C150, C595, and 1157. Both, in, both of these materials, the C595 and C1157, have been in national standards such as ACI 318, and 301 for many, many years, in fact, decades. So this is not a new, new addition. Number five on our list, specify supplemental cementitious materials. So all concrete today does have some amount of supplemental cementitious material in it in most cases. Uh, the most common are your obvious ones, fly ash, slag, silica fume, things of that nature. There are others available such as metacalin, which is a, a calcined clays, uh, volcanic rice, uh, uh, volcanic ash and rice ash, um, or rice husk, I should say, and also even ground glass to name a few. Some of these are waste byproducts of other industrial processes, and others are naturally occurring materials that require a little processing, and all of them ultimately, for that reason, have a smaller carbon footprint compared to cement. So all of these materials as well also enhance the performance of concrete when combined with portal cement. So that includes increasing strength, increasing durability, and also enhancing workability. There is a very complex uh, chemical process that occurs between SCMs and byproducts of cement hydration, and that's where you get these enhanced properties ultimately. As a quick visual here, you can see the impacts of SCM replacement of cement in a 6,000 PSI mix design. So on the left there, we have a 100% cement mix, 6,000 PSI at 28 days, compared to a 50% replacement, um, same end results in terms of performance, but a 45% reduction in GWP. And then going a step further to a 70% replacement um, where you see a 60% reduction in GWP. Now, as these materials are often recycled and minimally processed, offsetting the most, car most carbon intensive material cement is obviously the way we can reduce these, uh, these carbon impacts. But understandably, we do understand that schedule and plastic workability needs can prevent a blanketed 70% replacement across the project. So it still is important though to, to uh, emphasize replacement and it should be optimized whenever possible. And also from a cost perspective, cement is one of the most expensive materials in concrete. So as such, we do find that the inclusion of SCMs can yield GWP reductions, increased durability, and greater ultimate strengths, all while not impacting cost. The solution for this one, just as the previous ones, is pretty straightforward. Just make sure you list all types of cements and SCMs permitted by codes and standards. And there is no need to limit um, certain quantities of, the, of their mater these materials in your specification at this point. Number six, specify admixtures. So nearly every concrete made today uses some sort of admixture. Most affect the plastic properties in order to make concrete more workable, economical, adjust set time, and so on. Without admixtures, concrete could not be pumped hundreds of feet in the air or transported over long distances. And many architectural finishes ultimately could not be achieved. There are water reducing admixtures that in effect reduce cement demand, accelerators that improve strength gain, and viscosity modifiers that help flow concrete in a very tight places. As an example of how effective admixtures can be, simply using a water reducing admixture that reduces water content in a mixture by 12% will result in a reduced uh, cement content by up to 70 pounds for equivalent slump and strength. So this would yield about a carbon reduction of about 10% for 4,000 PSI concrete. Now, how does this work? Such things as super plasticizing high range water reducers can increase cementitious efficiency as mentioned before, through avoiding undesired agglomeration of particles, they tend to stick together at a macroscopic level and cement grains will, will stick together and ultimately reduces the exposed surface area and reduces the workability. All of these require additional, would require then additional water. Better dispersion helps yield more efficient hydration of the materials and ultimately a better PSI per pound of binder. This increased material efficiency is directly correlated to reduction in GWP. And ultimately, working with the ready mix producer is essential to tailoring these, the use of these materials and, and capturing the benefits of admixtures within your mix designs. 
Another quick take on admixtures is the benefit uh, that can benefit sustainable mix design is with modern strength enhancing admixtures. So these materials can aid in reducing cementitious content while maintaining performance criteria. So they meet the requirements of ASTM C494 type S admixtures and have the potential to beneficiate the hydration of cement grains for an overall increase in material efficiency. So these materials should be explored really with collaboration between the producer and the structural engineer. And early collaboration is key, um, going back to our original item one on our list. So as with, again, the previous items, this is another simple solution. So just make sure that all admixtures that meet ASTM standards should be permitted and listed in the specification. And do not meet, <clears throat> anything that does not meet a national standard could still be considered with other proper submittals and technical backup. Number seven on our list, don't limit ingredients. So all too often, there are seemingly random limits on material ingredients and project specifications that limit the concrete producer's ability to meet performance criteria, let alone reduce carbon footprint. So this includes such things as maximum water to cement ratio, air content requirements on all concrete, maximum cement, minimum cement, maximum flash, minimum flash, things of that nature. So having these unnecessary limits um, play into um, handcuffing the producer really and what they can do. So in most cases, such things as requiring a maximum water to cement ratio is unnecessary and it does drive up cement content. There are times when some of these criteria may be, be, make sense. So a maximum water to cement ratio might make sense, but it's usually for concrete that's, that's exposed to freezing or thawing and other harsh conditions but it's not necessary to call this out in the specification. Identifying the exposure class of the concrete for ACI 318 and 301 is what will suffice. The requirements for water to cement ratio then are captured in those exposure classes and prevent them from being blanketly applied to all the mixes on the project. So as a quick example on how water to cement ratio can be uh, impact the GWP of a mix, um, you can see here looking at a 0.45 compared to a 0.50, looking across the spectrum of uh, cementitious combinations, so 100% cement, 25% uh, flash, a ternary blend, and a 50% and 70%. And you can see a reduction that realizes about a 7 to 12% reduction in GWP for similar mixes. And as an interesting note, um, when I talk about this topic, is that reductions in water to cement ratio or water to cementitious ratio are not always achieved through reducing water content, as many would believe. So frequently, in order to maintain positive plastic properties, such as pumpability, finishability, the water content can only go so low. This results in lower water to cement ratios being realized through increasing cement content, which ultimately amplifies the negative impacts to sustainability. So as I mentioned, our recommendation here is to provide a table in your specification listing the important performance attributes and exposure criteria for concrete. So each project will have different values depending on the project requirements. And in this example, you can see class seven concrete exterior pavements would have a water to cement ratio and air content limit because of its exposure to freezing and thawing. But that is specifically spelled out in ACI 318 and 301 and not directly in the specification. And finally, concrete that is not stressed for similar amounts of time, as I mentioned before, they can be tested at later ages. So it's very important to capture that as well. Number eight on our list, set targets for carbon footprint. This strategy is for those who have some knowledge of life cycle assessment, experience with environmental product declarations, and an understanding of global warming potential for the targets to be implemented effectively. So first, resist the temptation to set carbon footprint limits for individual classes of concrete. It can be done in certain situations depending on the collaborative efforts, but in effect, we don't like to see prescriptive limits on materials that leave little room for adjustment from the contractor and producers. You wanna make sure that you encourage them to be able to innovate and meet project performance criteria and requirements within um, such things as budget and schedule. So the best approach is to use whole building life cycle assessment to set a carbon budget for all the concrete on the building. It is still necessary to have a general idea of what the carbon footprint of each mix will be to set a carbon budget for the building. So many concrete companies have published EPDs, so environmental product declarations for concrete and most would be willing to publish EPD specifically for a project if engaged early enough. In our MCA ourselves, we have published a cradle to gate life cycle assessment for ready mix concrete, um, and also an industry-wide EPD for concrete. Um, these can be used in place of a product specific EPD if they are not available. So armed with this information, you can conduct an LCA to determine the embodied impacts of concrete of a benchmark building using typical concrete mixes with typical amounts of SCMs, 
and then compare it to a proposed building that uses concrete mixes with higher volumes of flash and slag, for instance. And um, ultimately, LCA can be done iteratively um, throughout the design process to help understand the impacts of design changes on certain elements and assemblies. So you can do it at a, at a macro or a micro level, looking at just one beam in particular, if you're trying to size it and work with the, the architectural planning and programming and understanding the impacts at that level, and then copy it out throughout the, uh, the entire LCA. Ultimately, the superstructure can have its material takeoff utilized to quantify and compare benchmark impacts to achievable goals. So once you've calculated the carbon footprint for the proposed building, you can list that in your specification as shown here in order to set a budget of sorts for the project and add any additional um, tolerances as you see fit. At number nine here, we have sequester carbon dioxide. So carbonation, as I mentioned before, is a naturally occurring process by which atmospheric CO2 can penetrate the concrete surface and chemically reacts with cement hydration byproducts to form carbonates within the concrete. So effectively sequestering carbon dioxide. So this naturally occurring process is essentially how limestone was created in the first place. It can also be assumed to be essentially the reverse of cement manufacturing where CO2 is released. So you basically take your atmospheric carbon dioxide or carbon dioxide source combined with calcium byproducts and, and oxygen and hardened concrete, and you create and recombine into limestone, which is your calcium carbonate. For in-service concrete, carbonation is a slow process with many dependent variables. The rate decreases over time as carbonation decreases permeability. This creates a tighter matrix at the surface, which in, in effect reduces the rate of CO2 diffusion. So, while slow, the carbonation process does result in an uptake of some CO2 emitted from cement manufacturing. And theoretically, given enough time in ideal conditions, all of the CO2 emitted during um, calcination could uh, effectively be sequestered via carbonation. But presently, if you're reviewing a simple LCA covering A1 to A3, which is a cradle to gate um, that benefits concrete carbon uptake, the benefits of carbon uh, uptake of concrete are not quantified nor allocated to the project. So, Whole building LCA is really needed to observe the cradle to grave or in concrete's perspective, cradle to cradle perspective. So um, even then, practices and standards for quantifying carbon uptake and concrete are still being developed. But presently, it is estimated that over a typical building life, that concrete will absorb upwards of 20% of the CO2 emissions associated with cement manufacturing. And pavements themselves will go even further due to their increased surface to area volumes or surface to volume um, ratios. Another method for capturing the benefits of carbonation is to consider permitting the use of recycled concrete aggregates, which are made from demolished concrete. Once crushed, these materials expose, <clears throat> these materials expose a significant amount of uncarbonated surface area, which will absorb CO2 while being stored. By allowing their use and possibly requiring that they, these recycled aggregates be exposed to air for a certain period of time prior to being used, you can effectively capture and store CO2 directly in concrete. In some cases, a certain percentage of aggregate used in concrete may be recycled, so have a certain limit up to 10%, for instance, can be permitted or simply require that all aggregate base and fill on the project be made of crushed concrete. Other uh, interesting uses of uh, carbon dioxide sequest sequestration, um, there is the use of carbon mineralization processes, such as injecting uh, liquid CO2 into concrete during production or curing in CO2 environments, which should be encouraged as well. So this process is a very creative way of uh, essentially incorporating waste CO2 into concrete such that nano-sized limestone particles are created, and these can aid in strength gain of concrete materials, which potentially even allow for a further reduction in cementitious content. Uh, content. So you're adding CO2 while also reducing uh, cement content, which both of those will add up together and play into a reduced GWP. And there are also other new technologies that are actively scaling it as we speak. So in the marketplace, there are such things as artificial limestone aggregates. So this process generates material that can be added to concrete that is essentially made from CO2 captured at an emission source. So actually manufactured calcium carbonate limestone materials made from an emitter. And lastly here, we have number 10, encourage innovation. So of the 10 strategies, this is probably the most challenging. Uh, throughout this presentation, we talked about the importance of not listing specific products or naming certain technologies. Instead, just listing the, the standards that one must meet. So the problem with this though, is that it permits an innovation, but does not necessarily encourage it. And many innovations might not meet a standard today. So the recommendation here is really goes back to strategy one, so just communicating your carbon reduction goals to contractors and producers during the design process is critical. Let them know what you're looking for and that you're open to innovative solutions. 
engage with engineers and contractors and concrete producers and ask them to bring opportunities to the table. You'd be surprised again to see that many sophisticated producers are actively uh, experimenting with different formulations and technologies all the time. And they may already have some ideas on how they can actually lower the, carb the carbon impact of the concrete on your project. So ultimately, there is no silver bullet to making concrete with zero carbon footprint. It can be done, but at present, projects must follow a more surgical approach in which various means and methods are combined based on project conditions. Through communication and planning, your projects can utilize concrete with a significantly lower carbon footprint while also being open to the constant improvements that get us closer to our carbon footprint goals. Let's see, at this point, um, I'd like to hand the reins over to Margot, who's going to discuss how some of these strategies were being leveraged and implemented on the Intuit Dome project in Los Angeles, which is currently under construction. Margo, go ahead. Perfect, thanks, Brandon. Can you hear me okay? Just get a thumbs up from you and I'll keep yep, going. Yep. Awesome. All right, let me grab the screen from you. All right, welcome everyone. Thanks for being here today. Hopefully you got some good information out of Brandon's presentation. And what I'll hope to do here to follow up is to show a practical application of a lot of those strategies that Brandon just went over. I'll be sharing uh, our Intuit Dome project that is here in Southern California. I'm a structural engineer and project manager assisting on the project in Walter P. Moore's LA office. And we'll be sharing, this is an in-construction project, so I'll be sharing what we've done thus far in the design portion and how it's going in the field um, with some of these ap practical applications for reducing your embodied carbon in your concrete design by implementation of performance-based concrete specifications. So here we go. The project has quite a few team players, as you can imagine on something like this, even just at Walter P. Moore, we have structural engineering, sustainability consulting, construction engineering and enclosure engineering all on the project. Uh, this is uh, Steve Ballmer's foundation and, and ownership with LA Clippers. Design architect is AECOM. The contractor is an AECOM and Turner Hunt joint venture. Labib Bunk and Associates is our minority partner on the engineering side and primarily uh, overseeing the parking garage adjacent to the arena. Henderson Engineers is the MEP. Largo Concrete is our concrete subcontractor in Cal Portland slash Catalina Pacific is who provided the, the cement mixes or concrete mixes. So I'll go over a project overview just to see the general scope of the project, what the sustainability goals of the project are, uh, how our performance-based concrete specifications assisted in those sustainability goals, and then list a summary of some practical applications that you can use for your next project. Quick stats on the project. It's a $1.3 billion construction cost. It's 67,000 cubic yards of concrete and 21,200 tons of structural steel. Expected completion date is fall 2024. So as you can imagine, there's quite a bit of material here to focus on to try and consciously optimize the design. Location-wise, it's just south of SoFi Stadium and the Forum. You can see those in the background here in this rendering. Site plan shows the site just to the south of SoFi Stadium here. Uh, there will be a, the main arena site, and then to the west is a parking, parking garage with a pedestrian bridge, and then again on the east is another transportation and parking garage and hotel site. The project itself includes 18,000 seat arena for the LA Clippers. It is the first um, basketball first venue, which is what they're calling it, meaning that the arena is not designed to be a multi-purpose venue for other events. It is primarily focused for basketball only. There are three courts, including the main court, practice court, and promo court. The promo court is what you see here in this rendering, where there are team headquarters for practice facility and training. Up above, you can see the transfer trusses at the top there in black, supporting those facilities above this promo court. And then there's a diagrid shell with ETFE and PTFE panels, which you can see in red. It also has the largest halo scoreboard in the NBA, very similar to the one at SoFi. 
There are arena trusses, which can support up to 400,000 pounds of rigging capacity. On the exterior, there's a sunken garden and pool and pedestrian, or excuse me, concession pods surrounding the whole arena on the terrace level. There's also three parking garages and pedestrian bridges as mentioned before. So in general, a pretty large project. Sustainability wise, the goals for this project were pretty aspirational. Uh, Steve Ballmer and co wanted to make this the first, what they're calling a climate positive stadium and arena, meaning that they're setting a new standard for social responsibility in sports by building something that is sustainably conscious. And here's a list of some of the ways that we're trying to achieve that on the project. I'll focus on the LEED Platinum certification and how the concrete uh, contributes to that LEED Platinum certification. As some background as to why Walt P. Moore made sense as a consultant for this project, for a long time, we have embraced our role as engineers and architects at Walt P. Moore in the, in the pursuit to reduce embodied carbon by reducing it in our designs and finding room for change in every project. Dirk Kessner is our sustainability director. Kelly Roberts in Atlanta leads our concrete initiatives and Laura Carnap locally here in California on the architectural side leads our sustainability initiatives. So there was a pretty strong alignment of our mission statement and purpose as an organization with that of the arena and this project. Just to show that our commitment is, is just as external as it is internal, we are a signatory firm of the SE 2050, which is a response on the structure, from the Structural Engineers Institute to the Architecture 2030 pledge to reducing car, embodied carbon in our designs. And any firm that is signed on to this SE 2050 Act, any structural engineering firm that's signed on to SE 2050 has to come up annually with an embodied carbon action plan. Each year that has to be updated with more aggressive goals and more aggressive initiatives on how we're further improving our ability to reduce the embodied carbon in our materials and in our design. This year, what we are focusing on is the tracking of the embodied carbon through the materials throughout the stage of every project. So something here, like on the screen, you're seeing a project that's been tracked over from September 2019 through May 2020. So through the SD, DD, CD phases of a project, we continue to update the uh, embodied carbon within the materials for any given, at any given milestone of the project. And then this ring breaks down the the contribution of different materials. So here, for example, I know it's blurry probably on your end, but the concrete and red is over 37% for this sample project. Reinforcement is 25%. And then there's different concrete mixes, structural steel, et cetera. So we're trying to do this on every project. And we did this as well on um, clippers so that we could get a sense of the impact of each of the materials. So the first step, how do we start? is to do a whole building life cycle assessment of the structure. Uh, to do that, you can get, if you complete a whole building LCA analysis, that goes towards your lead life cycle impact reduction credit. Typically, you can get two to three points from this whole building LCA towards that life cycle impact reduction credit, which was why we decided to do this. And for the focus of this presentation, and ultimately really the focus of our LCA was on the concrete of this project. The structural steel is fairly unique because of the diagrid shell. It's harder to come up with a baseline structure, which is what you need to do when you do a whole building LCA, as those of you know who have done this and are familiar with it. So this primarily focuses on the concrete. We used tally and did a cradle to grave LCA and we started in DD with regular updates at the major project milestones. So in pink here, for example, this is one of our report summaries from Tally. The pink would be our baseline, and then the bronze or goldish bar is our um, is our improved project with using the NRMCA Pacific Southwest region as the EP the EPDs from those. To, for a, an envelope of many different mixes commonly used in the region as a functional, functional equivalent of the concrete portion of our structure. We'll ultimately update this once we get our 
uh, project specific EPDs, which I'll get into here in a little bit. But this is another result per division itemized by tally, um, which shows that we came up with approximately a 13% reduction in the global warming potential of our structure with the reduced um, with the local average EPDs compared to the the baseline structure. I won't go into the nuances of how we get those volumes and those materials, but essentially it requires us to kick out a separate Revit model that Tally can use and process the volumes through Tally for all of our different types of concrete mixes, assign a density, the mixed data, and then run a comparison of the, the baseline to those project specific mixes. So what does this look like once we've decided that our, the project at hand, what, whatever we've got in the project in terms of the mixed designs is working and is, is in fact improving on the baseline, how do we communicate that in our structural drawings? So the first thing, as Brandon mentioned, is to switch to a performance-based objectives and acceptance criteria rather than the prescriptive way of listing our requirements for the concrete mixes. The first thing we want to do is remove the water cement ratios wherever possible. As Brandon mentioned, this really is not necessary unless you have um, high porosity or a durability issue. So a parking slab where it's exposed for its life cycle and has a lot of wear and tear is an example of when you would want to maintain the water cement ratio. But most cases where you have internal um, uses, slabs or columns that are going to be covered up, you really could avoid the use of that water cement ratio. A better way to do it is to start to increase the allowable cement replacement or SCMs as Brandon mentioned, and also to extend the 28 day compressive strength metric. That's a standard for our industry is to check at 28 days if you've met the, as the design strength measured at 28 days, but sometimes you can extend that for elements that don't need to meet that strength right away. You can limit the cement content that's an, a good, a better way to do it, but the best way really, as Brandon had also mentioned, was not to limit any of the materials and instead set the global warming potential limits right on your drawings and request that the ready mix suppliers submit the EPDs for the mixes that they feel meet those global warming potential limits. So I will show you what that looks like on our drawings as an example. So this would be our project specific class of concrete matrix. We always put this on the first sheet of our set that for the concrete portion of our set, or sometimes it falls right in the front, like after the couple of sheets of general notes, it just depends. Um, and so here we've got the concrete usage depending on the element. And then I'll go to the next slide just to show a, a zoom in of some of the different uh, categories that I wanna focus on here. So you've got the minimum compressive strength that F prime C that's going to vary depending on the element. Then you've got that maximum water cement ratio that we mentioned. Then you've got the required cement replacement for those SCMs. And then over here on the right is where we've got our environmental requirements. So we do still have that max cement content in pounds per cubic yard. And then we also have these environmental impact indicators per cubic yard. So global warming potential, acidification, and smog. How this translates graphically into my previous slide of good, better, best is this. It's okay to list, uh, to remove and strip the water cement ratio where you don't need it. So you see that we have a lot of not applicables here and some of the cases where we've kept it. If we were to go completely in line with Brandon's recommendation, we would just list the exposure class and take this water cement ratio column right out because the exposure class should lead you to the water cement ratio that's naturally needed for that exposure class. Then we've got our required cement replacement. You can see that for something like our deep foundations, we're allowing 40 to 70% or requiring 40 to 70%, I should say, replacement of, it, of cement with supplementary cementitious materials like a fly ash. The better way to start to do this would correlate with this max cement content where we're limiting the amount of cement by element. Of course, that's gonna vary by element. Naturally, things like your foundations and columns are gonna have more cement than a floor slab. So you will see those numbers vary on your engineer's drawings. 
uh, but we try and limit them to what we think is um, an aggressive benchmark for the industry, the local market at hand. You can also extend that compressive strength benchmark from 28 days to 56 days. Foundations is a really easy place to do that. We really don't need those foundations to be at 5,000 PSI before 56 days because a, a substantial amount of the dead load of that building isn't even in place yet when they're first cast. Something like your uh, suspended slabs, however, you're likely not going to see an engineer extend that 28 day period to something longer because those do need to come to strength quickly so the contractor can remove shores and keep on moving. And then lastly, as mentioned, the best way to do it is to add these environmental impact indicators right here on your drawing, show the global warming potential, which is a measurement of kilograms of CO2 equivalent. Then you've got your acidification and smog as well. And that's really the best way to try and have some true collaboration with your ready mix supplier is to just put the environmental requirements right on there and let them figure out what the max cement content required cement placement and water cement ratio could be to meet those environmental impact indicators. Once they think they've found a mix that meets those environmental impact indicators, they will send them to you in a concrete mix submittal. And of course, this will flow through you all as the architects of record and then administratively head to the engineer of record. But I felt like it was probably helpful for you all to see the things that you would then look for on that concrete mix design to see if those impact indicators are in fact being met. So this is an example from Clippers for an elevated deck with a hybrid aggregate mix. You can see they've used that type 1L um, Portland limestone cement that Brandon was mentioning before, which I'll get into a little bit more after this. Then they've listed the maximum cement in pounds per cubic yard, and then they've got their EPD as attached to the concrete mix submittal, which shows those climate change numbers. And those are how those relate to the class of concrete matrix that we've put on our drawing. So then your engineer of record would look for that max cement content, make sure they stayed below that threshold, and that they've met your global, your environmental impact indicators as well. So some of the ways that we brought this to, to life on Clippers, we worked closely with Cal Portland and Largo. They were brought on board pretty early to put together possible mix designs that could influence the structural design. Some of the ways that we did that were offering high quality sand and aggregates. You may have heard of the Orca aggregate from British Columbia that shows up in barges to Long Beach and is highly available to our Southern California market. Northern California, the aggregates are the, the local ag aggregates are naturally much better than here in Southern California. So I don't think there's as much import of Orca to Northern California, but in general, just getting high quality and dense sand and aggregates will naturally reduce the amount of cement required in those mixes. And then of course, a very easy lift and one that's becoming more and more common is to substitute your ordinary Portland cement with this Portland limestone cement, this hydraulic blend that Brandon mentioned, where it's about five to 15 percent limestone that supplements the cement and brings down your uh, your global warming potential of that mix by about 10 percent. There has been concern, and I get this question a lot about the market availability of this Portland limestone cement. But the honest answer is that the market availability will increase if engineers and owners specify it. The more that there's a request for it, most of these ready mixers or um, cement producers only have one silo, so they can really only produce either ordinary Portland cement or Portland limestone cement. So if there's more of a demand for this Portland limestone, then it makes it easier for them to make that switch. An example of how this shows up in your engineer specifications and probably yours as well is this hydraulic cement where we've got this ASTM C595 and the ASTM C1157, which allows for this type of uh, Portland limestone cement and the performance-based uh, cement uh, mixes that Brandon mentioned. ASTM C150 is of course your regular traditional port, ordinary Portland cement. So we're still including it. We're not gonna exclude it, but we're gonna make sure that we just add the C595 to our specifications. 
The other way, as we talked about as well, or Brandon talked about, is just em embracing emerging concrete trends and technology as much as you can. So in addition to the Portland limestone cement substitute for ordinary Portland cement, increasing those um, the fly ash and slag and the supplemental cementitious materials that you allow as much as possible. Um, ask for finer cement where high early strength is still needed so that you can balance out the, the low um, come up of strength that a lot of high SEM mixes have. The more fly ash you have, it typically tends to make your mix come to strength a little slower, but you can combat that with finer cement if you need to, or there are a plenty of um, admixtures out there that can help to boost that high early strength if you need it. Then utilization of technology, for example, on a separate project, not Clippers, but another one where we use the Portland limestone cement um, and some PT slabs, we use maturity meters there to make sure that we were hitting those high early strengths without the use of excessive amounts of concrete cores and brake tests. So we didn't have to ask the labs to be open late nights or on weekends. We could just use those institute maturity meter results to find out if the slab was in fact meeting the 3000 PSI that strength that we needed to stress those slabs. Then of course, there's the carbon dioxide sequestration that we talked about. One method of that that is starting to show up quite a bit, at least in Southern California, and I imagine in Northern California as well, is carbon cure, which is a carbon dioxide mineralization where they essentially inject the CO2 into the concrete at the batch plant. And then it shows up to your site in the drum ready to put on site. And it's basically been, it's almost like a soda. It's almost been carbonated and put uh, injected directly into the mix. Now it's important to know that this is um, only beneficial if it's a liquefied recyclable CO2. If people are creating this liquefied CO2 just to put into the car into the concrete mix, it's obviously not as environmentally sustainable or preferred as finding recycled CO2 that can be put into the fresh mix. It also only offsets about 5% of the cement at best. So this is a, a small but effective way to introduce a, a, a way of reducing the cement in your mix, but it's not going to be as effective as say the Portland limestone that can replace up to 10 to 15%. So in summary, where we are on the project now, we have gone through the life cycle assessment. We are, um, these slides that have been showing with some of the photos are from the site, their foundations are being placed. A lot of the shear walls at this point have been placed. The shotcrete basement walls have been placed as well. And um, where that's put us, this is the uh, national average for Portland cement at 922 metric tons of uh, global warming potential is the national average. To give you a sense of how that compares, the Cal Portland type one and type two and type five, which would correlate to your ordinary Portland cement, uh, the traditional type of cement that were the C150, specifically from Cal Portland and there, I think this is their Mojave batch plant, this shows about an 11% reduction in the global warming potential off the national average, that 824. And then the type 1L, that's that advancement HS of 746 is about a 20% reduction off the national average. So this is a great sign for us that shows that our whole building LCA could likely be improved once we put in the project specific mixes and EPDs into the tally, we'll probably see that 13% increase to something closer to this 20 like these mixes are showing us, uh, which is really exciting to see. And what that means for us in California is that these materials are here and they are available. So make sure that you are getting with your structural engineer to implement these on your next project. Again, these are a little bit more focused on the structural engineer in terms of things they can do for the next project, but again, important for the entire team to know. Provide those global warming limits in your specifications and put them on your drawings. Make sure that that concrete matrix indicates them and relaxes the limit on specific materials and just lets the ready mix supplier produce a mix with an EPD that backs it up that shows that they can meet those global warming limits. Um, request the submission of EPDs for each mix. We already mentioned that. Inclusion of higher density orca aggregate and sand where possible or necessary in Southern California, including the type 1L cement, 
Uh, there will be a CIOSC white paper available on this coming out shortly that will be in circulation and a great resource for those of us in the industry looking for ways to, to bring this up with clients as well if we feel like that's the point in the project where there might be some interest. We're just not sure how to bring up the conversation and when. This white paper will give some guidance on that. Increasing that 56 day versus 28 day strength uh, and early engagement of your concrete sub and ready mix supplier. I can't stress enough how important that is to making this all come together to know what's readily available in your market so that you're able to push the boundaries of what's attainable without um, sole sourcing to one person who's potentially the only supplier able to meet those metrics. And with that, I will um, kick it back to I think Rebecca for if there's any questions or time left for questions. Sure. So we do have a few questions that are in the uh, Q&A portion. So it looks like the first one is how will the destruction and eventually new construction of the concrete buildings in Ukraine affect global climate warming? I mean, that's a <laughs> that's an unfortunate scenario oh. to be in, obviously. Um, I can't really speak to that particular market other than I think historically they are a larger concrete market just because of the climate and whatnot. But um, inclusion of demolished concrete is something that is pretty standard practice globally. Um, they easily remove reinforcing materials and leave the, the crushed concrete materials um, available for use, whether it's as a base material or incorporating into structural concrete. Now, lower strength concretes can accommodate higher replacements. And then um, higher strength concretes, they typically would limit the replacement and, and basically blend it with virgin aggregates. Um, so that's something that they could do, but um, it'd be more specific market to market, I guess, at that point. All right. Uh, can you talk about the finished quality of utilizing some of these carbon reduction options? They are concerned about level of cracking, coloration, et cetera. Are there some options that actually help the finished quality? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, and as mentioned at one point, you know, the, the flexibility for the producer and contractor is key because, you know, your, your concrete contractor has experience with this, this, this stuff um, and allowing them to adjust accordingly is going to be uh, important. Um, in general, inclusion of some SCMs is highly beneficial to placing and finishing. So you get improved fluidity, um, sometimes improved set characteristics. It does, you know, vary seasonally. In California, we have a pretty you know, accommodating climate, so that's not so much a benefit, but, you know, in hotter climates, SCMs will help stabilize the set control and, and produce better quality finishes and things of that nature. Um, very high replacements, um, where you get really ambitious, is going to be, you know, something that does require some additional care and attention. Um, more specifically, curing time is where you need to, you know, keep an eye on those higher replacements, giving them better quality, better lengths of time for curing, um, whether it's cover cured, whatever it is. Um, but those very high replacements are typically in such things as foundations, as Marco mentioned, um, where ultimately the finish is moot. So that flexibility is going to be key. And whenever you know your finish is concerned, whether it's color for architectural needs, things of that nature, that's always going to be and always has been an area of special attention between the concrete producer and your concrete contractor and then the architect. So um, it's an important question to have. But um, in general, inclusion of some SCM materials is definitely going to help. Um, and you might just with that through that collaboration is where you may, might limit it in certain situations. Brandon, is it true that if you find a single source for like your aggregate cement and fly ash that that can help that issue just to make sure you're keeping it all as a single source? I've heard yeah, that before. A, yeah, it's a good question to have because as, as it seems obvious at times, but not obvious at other times that, you know, you have these small fine materials in your sand that can add, you know, a brownish tinge, things of mm -hmm. that nature. Um, as you go through a quarry, you can go, shift from, from one shelf to another and the performance characters are, are the same, but one shelf is darker than the other. And if you're exposing, grinding the concrete, polishing it, you'll get variations there. So again, those, that's where, you know, it comes down to largely communication on the front end, but consistency in the materials is definitely going to play in the consistency of your finishes, whether it's visual or um, other yeah. aesthetic things. And curing, things like that for cracking, that's always going to come down to good quality practices that are really well understood and have always really been implemented. I will say for uh, a separate project, not Clippers, but the UCSD Future College or Theater District Living Learning Neighborhood in, in San Diego, that 
uh, we are also engineer of record on, we're using that Portland limestone type 1L specifically from Cal Portland, their advancement HS, so Portland limestone cement. It naturally has a whiter, a whiter finish to it. And the university specifically chose it, not because of its sustainable um, characteristics, but because of that whiter, cleaner finish, because they love to expose all of their concrete. Um, they're well in, it, in construction now. I just went and saw the site myself last week and the concrete finish is some of the best I've ever, ever seen. It's, it's beautiful. So for those of you uh, on the aesthetic side who might be concerned, I would say it does depend on where you get your product from, but it is possible to get a very clean, white, beautiful looking concrete with these fly ash, with Portland limestone cement, it is possible. You just have to make sure you're getting it from the right suppliers. Great, so it looks like we're out of time, but uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, we will go ahead and have the presenters answer all of the open questions and we'll send that in the follow-up email to everyone. Um, I do want to thank both of you again for this informative presentation. For the attendees that have made it thus far, AIA California will submit you for those credits and it will appear on your transcripts in a few weeks. As always, additional resources and tools can be found on the AIA California website, uh, including the recording from today. So no worries, everyone will have another chance to, to go through this really great presentation. And then our next webinar focused on induction cooking will qualify for zero net carbon design mandatory CE, and it will be held on May 12th. More information will be made available to you in that follow-up email that I mentioned, and we will see you on our next webinar. Thank you both for being here very, very much. Thank you. Thank Bye, you. everyone. Bye. Bye.